Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum audience. Today we are discussing in a very complex uh, issue that has been uh, in study for many scholars these days. That is US uh, and China conflict. That conflict started from trade war to, and then, uh, then, uh, uh, then shifted for, to tech war. And now it is transforming and many don't know how it will lead, uh, how it will gonna, uh, shape up in near future. And today I'm honored by Mr. Mark uh, from, uh, he's a career journalist and I'm uh, based in, uh, right now he's in UK. How are you, Mark? I'm fine, Kawaja. How are you? I'm good. Uh, so my first straight, my first question is help us and help our audience to uh, make a sense of how this Sino-US conflict will emerge in uh, near future. Well, let me start by saying that this has been a conflict whose roots go back to 1949 and the Chinese Revolution. Uh, led by Mao Zedong. Um, America has always had uh, a great deal of trepidation and in fact between 1949 and 1972 had very little if any contact uh, with what was then called communist China and that's important because people are starting to call it that again here and uh, not here but in the United States. What's interesting is that in 1972 of course Richard Nixon um, went to China to the surprise of many people on the world stage. Um, and then, uh, I believe it was seven years later, there was a period of relative detente uh, between the U.S. and China. Relations were established, and certainly there were issues, uh, but there was at some point the notion that America and China could get along in the world. That has started to fall apart, as you very correctly pointed out at the top of the broadcast, uh, partly because America has a president who you can't really pin down as to what he wants to do or where he wants to go with China. There was a report going back to, I believe, January or February of this year uh, that he contacted uh, Chinese President Xi and essentially said, help me get reelected. Uh, and, and at the very beginning of the coronavirus said that the Chinese were, had been doing a good job. Now we're at a point for a number of different reasons, and we can get into that, whether it be trade or the South China Sea or the situation in Hong Kong or the way Uyghurs are being treated, um, where we have, as a consequence, embassies shut down in Houston, Texas, and I believe Chengdu in China. Um, and of course, you have uh, a ramping up of rhetoric. And, and to me, that's probably the most dangerous part of this. Uh, in America, uh, the ramping up of the rhetoric has been as simple as calling the uh, coronavirus pandemic China, uh, China virus or Kung flu, uh, both of which have come out of the mouths of both President Trump and some people who are close to President Trump. That has led some belief uh, to harassment and in some cases out and out violence against Chinese Americans inside the U.S. The Chinese, on the other hand, uh, are dealing with uh, some legitimate points from a United States uh, perspective. The, treater, the treatment of the Uyghurs is something that many people, certainly many Muslims in the U.S., have a grave concern about. Uh, they're they're you know, talking about internment, they're talking about any number of things that people get very upset about uh, from a human rights perspective. Now, Donald Trump is not the world's perfect person to talk to anybody about human rights, least of all China, but this is an issue. It's a very, very important issue if you have a concern about human rights. Also, the crackdown in Hong Kong, uh, where there was in 1997, the belief that, and the commitment by China, that Hong Kong would be able to operate under its own set of laws, its own set of regulations, et cetera. And now that President Xi has taken power 23 years later, we see something very different coming forward. So those are some of the things, and we can get into trade and the South China Sea a little bit further down the road. So uh, thank you for uh, answering this question. As uh, we have seen uh, in last year and even in this year that America's Middle East policy has uh, failed uh, primarily. It seems that it has, America has failed to deliver peace in Middle East. 
and uh, and uh, while that in uh, uh, in middle of this thing in pandemic there were protests all over in america and america was going through its worst uh, times actually if uh, uh, if i may take the liberty of this uh, online platform to uh, call it worst times of its history so how you see these protests will uh, impact uh, uh, trump's pre- uh, next coming election that are uh, due in to, uh, november so uh, how you see this election will uh, result well if you're talking about the protests around george floyd and the murder of george floyd yeah. by police officers in minneapolis yeah, about that um, protest that started uh, after the uh, after the humiliation of uh, regarding the people of color and discrimination that is uh, that is uh, uh, that is in the dna of america well you see that's an important point in the dna of america a lot of americans don't want to admit that it's part of america's dna the fact is that george floyd was the fur the latest in a long list of unarmed black people who were killed by police um when i first started working in radio which was in 1973 uh there was an issue with a 12 year old boy by the name of clifford glover who was shot and killed by a police officer a couple of years later there was a 15 year old named randolph evans same situation um and you know there there were some basic questions that were never answered um the cop that shot randolph evans a guy named robert torsney and uh, this is in 1974 just to be clear ended up um going to uh, uh uh actually pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity and won that case and no one ever asked the question why is somebody who's insane given a gun and told to uphold american law and did so by shooting a kid in the face um but that's a long time ago but there are any number of people i could name subsequent to that time leading up to george floyd george floyd's murder was the straw that broke the camel's back for a lot of black people in america a lot of black people in america and when you put that on the world stage okay where you have demonstrations here in brighton where i am in the uk they had 10,000 people that marched the street uh essentially around the issue of black lives matter because they have their own issues in the uk and what you're seeing now is and, and by the way this also affects us china relations because the chinese you know when the us criticizes them about the weakers the chinese turn back around and say well what about black people in the us even though they have their own issues with the way they treat africans both in china and in africa but what you're seeing now uh is something that could have the potential to have a deep impact on this current election that's coming up in november donald trump and people who support him have portrayed some of the people that have been involved in the protests as rioters as part of an organization and i shouldn't call it an organization but a group called antifa which uh is uh, an anarchist group and therefore has no real organization uh but they're bent on destroying america i'm not saying that that's what the president is essentially saying many of his allies and and people uh who work for him are saying these things at the same time there are right wing organizations that are doing the same thing and and in some cases being involved in this in this violence there the polls are uh, polls are indicating that joe biden is uh, joe biden is probably going to win the election next presidential election but how you see if, uh, uh, what we can expect from trump uh, our trump administration in these two months uh, could there be a possible of any false flag operation or any political stunt it's always possible uh and even absent all that uh donald trump has a puncher's chance of winning you know in, in four years ago nobody thought donald trump was going to win the election probably not even donald trump but he did win he didn't win the popular vote but he won through the electoral college which is a whole different discussion this time around biden is you're absolutely right biden is winning in the polls that doesn't mean he's won the election yet and the x factor here are what are called either mail in vo- voting or absentee voting because that is going to be done this time around because of the pandemic in huge numbers 
And we saw during some of the primaries, uh, uh, both Democratic and Republican across the country, that it took some uh, uh, municipalities and some states weeks to bring back these absentee ballots and, and to actually decide the results of some of those primaries. That could be something that happens in this case. Thank you. Lastly, uh, uh, last question to conclude uh, our discussion today. Uh, what, uh, what are you seeing as Sino-US relations future after the presidential election? Uh, if Joe Biden wins, what would be, uh, how it would look like? Or if Trump wins, and what, what are the chances of uh, uh, its getting, getting of its, uh, the, uh, its uh, you even say, its relationships worst? Well, here's the interesting thing that a lot of people don't know about Joe Biden. Joe Biden, when he was vice president of the United States, was the president, Barack Obama's point man on China. Joe Biden knows a lot about China, and a lot of people don't realize that. I would imagine that the first thing he'd do, were he to be elected, would be to try and ramp down some of the tensions that currently exist. Nobody, and I emphasize nobody in the United States, wants to see any kind of armed or military conflict between the US and China. However, the Chinese, and I think this is fair to say, even though they might deny it, the Chinese really want to uh, become uh, a co-equal superpower with the United States, certainly technologically. And I think that there is uh, a lot of pushback in the States that has bled over to, for example, the uh, uh, Huawei situation where uh, uh, the UK turned around at the behest of Donald Trump, by the way, uh, and said that they could not be uh, involved in the UK's 5G rollout. That kind of technological stuff is gonna be the battleground here. Again, nobody wants uh, a, a military conflict, but this technological contest, I believe, will continue for some time to come, regardless of who ends up being the American president, because I think the Chinese have a mission and a long-term strategy here. And America is competing against that strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you for covering this uh, very com uh, complex issue for our audience. And I'm thankful you joined us and I hope audience uh, have, uh, it, it was thoughtful for our, our audience as well. Thank you, Mark. All right, no problem. Thank you.